by the Lord with me. Come exalt his name together. Glorify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name forever. Oh, taste and see. saints give you everything give you everything magnify the Lord with me come exalt, exalt his name together glorify the Lord with me come exalt Bless the Lord every day and night, never ending praise. May our incense rise. Let us bless the Lord every day and night, never ending praise. May our incense rise. Let us bless the Lord every day and night. Lost it. 
its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. In came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul When Christ 
Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim by God how great thou art then sings my soul my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Amen. You may be seated. Happy Palm Sunday, everyone. It's good to see you, and uh, we serve a tremendously awesome and great God, don't we? Amen. It's great to sing those old hymns and sing some new songs as we worship together, and it's wonderful to realize that in generations preceding us, there have been people faithfully proclaiming and calling and singing upon the name of the Lord, and we are in that line of faithful witnesses continuing with the challenge today for us to be faithful to proclaim it. And so, as we continue our worship, I just want to invite you to uh, not just enjoy worship this morning, but also this evening. There's a special event tonight over at Silver Wings uh, Ballroom where they usually do roller skating. There's no roller skating tonight. Instead, we have a big community worship service to help prepare churches across our community uh, for Easter in preparation for Easter to prepare our hearts as God's people to come together and praise Him. And so we want to invite you to be there. Doors open at 5.30 tonight, and I would recommend that you get there a little early because parking fills up fast as well as seating. But the uh, worship event starts at 6 p.m. It's going to be a great evening. Uh, Adam and I are both serving there tonight, and so we invite you to bring friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, anyone that you realize, hey, they, they, maybe they wouldn't go to church, but maybe I can get them over to Silver Wings. They'll, get, they'll, they'll go there. But it's going to be a great evening. Uh, we're going to have lots of phenomenal worship, some strong challenge uh, from some different local pastors. And we just want you to be part of that and experience it and be able to come together. And when we come together, I believe, based on what Jesus prayed for us in John 17, that when we demonstrate unity as the body of Christ, it bears witness to the fact that the Father sent him as the atonement for sins, which is what Easter is all about. It's the death, burial, and resurrection. And so he prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one so that the world would believe that the Father sent him. So we are going to do that tonight, and we encourage you to be there. We also have Easter coming up in a week, and so make sure you invite folks and bring friends and family to the Easter services. Uh, We will have normal Easter services this year, so we'll continue our regular schedule. We're not changing anything up, so you know when to be here, but we encourage some of you knowing that we'll probably have bigger crowds if you are willing and able to wake up a little early and not attend our second hour for services, which is right now, but our first hour, which is early. Come then. There's always a few extra seats in the first hour because not everybody hits their alarm clock and gets up right away. So uh, make sure you you plan accordingly for the Easter services. And then uh, also... Um, We want to make sure that everyone is aware we have Vacation Bible School uh, in the very early stages of getting coordinated and put together for our summer uh, activities. There is a table in the foyer, and uh, we want volunteers to get uh, signed up as 
early as possible this year. So the signups are out there. Um, talk to the kids ministry staff if you have questions. But one of the reasons that we're bringing this up right now, kind of in March, which we're still several months away, is Shauna Novak, our children's ministry director, um, received the diagnosis that she does have lymphoma, and so she is down at MD Anderson getting treated. And if you know Shauna, she loves our kids and the kids of this community like no one else's business. She just loves them to death. And she told me, John, I just, I'm sitting here stir crazy thinking I got to get stuff done for VBS. And here's what I told her this week. I said, Shauna, you worry about getting better. You let us worry about VBS. Amen. All right. So church, we need volunteers. You don't even have to work with kids. There's plenty of things you can do, but the sign-up sheet is over there. There's that, and I'm not, I'm not telling a fib. That's a true thing. There's so many things you can do with VBS. You don't even have to work with kids. There's so many things you can do with food prep or design or decor or whatever else. There's all kinds of things you can do. And so make sure you go over to the table in the foyer after the services today. Put your name down, and one of our kids' ministry staff will get together with you. We will have a kind of an all-hands-on-deck training the first Sunday in May after church. And so the first Sunday in May after church, we're having an all-hands-on-deck meeting, but we're trying to get as much done now in advance to make sure that we're ready for VBS this year. So uh, make sure you join the team and, and be part of that. Um, if you are a guest or visitor, we're so glad that you're here this morning and uh, glad that you are here worshiping with us. As we observe a worship through giving, we do have giving out in the foyer through some offering boxes next to the door as you enter into the sanctuary as well as online. Uh, but let me pray for us as we continue worshiping our Lord and Savior this morning. Father, we thank you that we can come and that, Lord, you are an all-powerful God, that all the other powers that are in this world and even throughout the universe, Father, bow the knee to you. You are over all of the created order. There is none higher like uh, higher than you. When we read through different portions of Scripture, and I think about uh, different portions of Isaiah, the, the comment over and over shows up, who is like the Lord and to whom would you liken him? Father, there is no one else. And so we come to you now in this moment to worship you corporately as a church family. We come to you to acknowledge that we are the ones, Father, who must be the students, and you must be the one who is teaching us from your word as you reveal it to us and your spirit illuminates the text for us. And so, Father, I pray that as we continue our worship, we would have a posture to be humble and to learn and to understand, Father, what you desire from us as your people. Father, we love you and we thank you and we continue our worship now in Jesus name. Amen. I hear the Savior say thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all jesus paid it all all to him i owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Now indeed I find Thy power and Thy alone Can change the leopard spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sing the crimson stain he washed it white as snow and when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson.
hearts and say he washed it white as snow sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow sin had left a crimson stain washed it white as snow. Amen. We have been washed white as snow by the blood of the Lamb, and next week we will celebrate that as we celebrate Easter. But today we have a special guest. Many of you guys know this guy. He's a world-renowned legend around these parts, Cliff Wilson. Uh, Cliff has been a member of our church for a uh, long, long, long time. 20 years ago. 20 years, and uh, he served as an elder here for many years, and uh, after a long tenure, he rolled off the board to take some time, more time with family and other priorities that he had, that he realized we had a, a valuable men that could step in and help fill that role, and he continues to teach our junior high ministry and has been very active there, and so all of my kids uh, are, will have or will soon be exposed to Mr. Wilson's teaching, and he does a great job. He is uh, one who puts the uh, all of the text of Scripture together. So if you were here last week, he opened us up uh, really with this big paradigm shift with Isaiah 53 while I was out with the family on vacation. And he's going to continue today to show the tail end of the story, or that's uh, the rest of the story, as they say. Yeah. So, Cliff, let me pray for you. Father, we just thank you for Cliff. And uh, just be with him as he delivers your word this morning. I thank you for just how much our church family loves him and his family. And thank you for the blessing that he is. We just pray that uh, you'd speak through him in a powerful way, uh, allow us to see, really, Father, the bigger story of your plan for redemption and salvation and what is ahead. And so we just pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Uh, I, it's a great privilege for me uh, to be here and to do this. And uh, I asked John if I could do this. This, this. this scripture has, you know, it's burdened me for a long time. I've always wanted to try to tackle it. And um, here we go. So, um, the, if you were here last week, I started off by just reading straight through Isaiah chapter 53. And uh, if familiarity breeds contempt, contempt's probably not the right word, but complacency might be that, oh yeah, I've heard that all before. And you have. I mean, th this is, is the most quoted passage of all of the Old Testament scripture by the, the writers of the New Testament. They keep going back and back and back and forth to Isaiah 53. So you've heard all of those. Every phrase in there almost is quoted in the New Testament. Um, the, it, uh, within that passage of Scripture is the incarnation, the life, the rejection, the trial, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, the intercession, and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. All in that one passage of Isaiah chapter 53, written 700 years before Christ. Um, many people have called it the fifth gospel. Accurately, they should call it the first gospel, okay? Um, because it wasn't 700 years later that the, the gospel writers showed up on the scene and gave us what we now know as the gospel. So it, it is a powerful um, passage of scripture that is unplumbable by me or anybody else. Um, so in the limited time we have, uh, we can just touch on it. Um, 
I talked about paradigms. A paradigm is a belief system that frames, you know, how people think um, by, by group. Uh, it's a shared mental model. Um, and, you know, generally paradigms work. You know, that's why it's shared. People believe the same. Um, but sometimes those paradigms are wrong. And sometimes, and, and poignantly throughout scripture or throughout history, they have shifted. And I touched on three of them that have happened in our natural lifetime. Uh, that was, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor. Hey, Japanese couldn't pull it off until they did. <laughs> no one thought they could, and there they were. Um, the 9-11. Uh, hey, hijackings, cooperate, graduate here, do what they say, um, and everybody lands and goes home after a few days. Until that was not the case on 9-11. And, uh, and we all, you know, even if you thought that might be a hijacking that hit Tower One, you thought, what a, what a, you know, what a mistake. I mean, it's a beautiful day. No one would do that. Until everybody, the plane hit Tower Two. And everybody instantly knew we were wrong, that that's intentional, okay? Um, most recently, October the 7th uh, in, in Israel, in Gaza, um, you know, the IDF, this is the, this is the most powerful military, maybe on earth, certainly in that region. Uh, we got the most powerful border wall there, unbreachable, until it was breached 29 times by the JV team. Uh, and it was game, set, match, junior varsity, against the uh, IDF. There are 1,400 slaughtered uh, horribly uh, in southern Israel on that day. Major paradigm shift. And so I made the case that what is coming on the world is a paradigm shift par excellence, okay? Beyond any paradigm shift that has ever been or will ever be, the most significant paradigm shift laid out in scripture for us, hidden in plain sight, okay? So we're going to try to sleuth it out a little bit. Uh, I can just skim the tops of some of these things in our limited time. My hope is that you guys will dive into this on your own and really don't take my word for it. See what the word says and, and see how we can apply that to our life. Um, within that paradigm, paradigm, uh, you know, paradigm paralysis is what I'm trying to avoid here. When you think this is how it's supposed to be, and reality hits you smack between the nose and says, no, this is how it is. We don't want to be paralyzed by paradigm paralysis. And the antidote to that, the answer to that, is sound, comprehensive, biblical analysis, okay? So, so the more we can dive into scripture, the less uh, subject we will be uh, in our time as things, as the sand beneath our feet shifts uh, nonstop. So uh, I went back to the beginning. Now I can't cover all this ground again. Um, I would love to, but um, it's on YouTube. If you want to look at the Brandon Bible Church YouTube channel, you can see it all from what I did. But in a nutshell, we started with Israel uh, getting off the ark. Um, basically, they were not part of the original 70 nations that immediately went back into rebellion. God said, I'm going to take that guy right there. And he chose Israel out of the nations as his holy nation, set apart to him, chosen to be a special vessel, a conduit to bring the rest of the world into right relationship back with God, into reconciliation with God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They failed in that. They were, they were called out of Egypt. Um, we know that God busted them out of slavery in the Exodus. Uh, he destroyed the Egyptian gods. He led them through on dry land, through the sea, uh, protected them, and, and chastened them in the desert, led them to the promised land, uh, and, and the conquest of Canaan went over all of that last uh, week. And he did it by the strong arm of the Lord, the mighty arm of God, the outstretched, uh, mighty hand and outstretched arm. Followed that whole sequence through that, that, that ultimately in Scripture you see where it's not just anthropomorphic language anymore. It is the arm of the Lord takes on personhood. And we know in hindsight that that person is Jesus Christ. He is the strong arm of the Lord that would accomplish a new exodus. So the prophets began to talk about an exodus that would come on the world, an exodus from their sins, from the slavery to sin. So that's where we left it off uh, last week. I'm going to start with just a quick passage in the book of Hosea, chapter 11, if you want to turn there. Um, it is, the, the whole book of Hosea, Hosea is a meta-narrative of, of a rebellious bride. This is the bride of God. Uh, rebellious to him, uh, went whoring with the other nations. Um, just the worst case scenario, uh, as personified through Hosea and his wife Gomer. 
But, but in that, there's another, there's a lot of visual images of God's relationship with his people. One of them is as a father to an adopted son. And that's what I'm going to read right here in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further away from, from me, the further he went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim how to walk, taking, te- taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness. With ties of love, I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. So this is the adopted son of, of God, of Israel. Now, if you'll fast forward to Matthew, um, book of Matthew, chapter 2, um, verse uh, 13 through 15. Now, set the stage here. This is when the Magi came to see uh, the baby Jesus, or the toddler, or whatever, how old he was, and picks it up there. When they had gone, this is the Magi, the, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet that I just read. Out of Egypt I called my son. So again, the son, the adopted son, failed. So God said, I'm going to have to call my own son. We just sang about it. You know, He came down from heaven to accomplish that which, which Israel failed to do. Um, so, and it was going to be accomplished by the arm of the Lord personified, Jesus Christ's own son. So, um, today, we're going to talk about, we're going to pick it up there where we left off, of the exodus, the second exodus from the arm of the Lord that's coming on the world. I left with Isaiah chapter 1 and 5, if you remember, if you were here last week, and it was a, uh, Isaiah chapter 1, basically it is a, it is a, damnation of Israel. It said, you are sin sick from head to toe, thoroughly corrupt, um, and, and they don't realize it. In, in Isaiah chapter 5, then he, you know, the, the strong arm of the Lord was against his own people. It says, whoa, whoa, whoa. These are curses coming on the house of Israel, his own house. Now, at the time of Isaiah preaching this, the northern ten tribes of Israel had already been vomited out of the land, as predicted, into Syria, never to have returned. They have not returned at this point, so it's scattered. Um, the two southern tribes of Benjamin and Judah were still in the land and being warned that you're about to go into the same exile into Babylonian captivity for my servant Nebuchadnezzar. Now, repent, you know, change your ways. How, how was that message received? Well, history tells us uh, they're pretty sure that uh, Isaiah got sawed in half, okay? so. We don't want to hear that guy. We're not going to listen to him. And so we know what happened. They did. They went into exile, as God promised he would, um, sent them into exile. Uh, we know, so exilic, you hear that term, uh, exilic, the, so exilic prophets of uh, Ezekiel and Daniel that were in exile that prophesied while there, telling us of future things to come for the house of Israel. Daniel knew that the prophet Jeremiah had already predicted that they would be in exile for 70 years. He's tapping his watch going, hey, um, you know, 70 years about up. Well, we know that happened. Uh, the Babylonian Empire fell to the Medo-Persian Empire. And in 537, 538 B.C. time frame, that, that by order of the King Cyrus of Persia, the, uh, the Jewish people were allowed to return to the land, as Jeremiah had prophesied. Now, you might not know. It, you, we would think, oh, they all were chomping at the bit and ready to go back. Most, the majority, did not return. Okay, it was a... It was a a minority that actually went back to Israel. Significant minority, and we know what happened after that. Nehemiah went and built the wall. There, there's a lot of scripture that, that talks about what happened. Um, but, uh, but, it, but that was what we would consider the first diaspora or dispersion of the Jewish people, okay? So the Jewish people remnant went back to the land, and there's always going to be a remnant in the land. There always has been, always will be. But, but, but a significant portion of the Jews were dispersed throughout the Middle East, through uh, Babylon, through Medo Persia, through that whole region, some in Africa. We see this, you know, at different various times in the New Testament when Jews from all the other lands are coming back to Jerusalem for the Passover, etc. 
So that was the first diaspora, diaspora, however you want to say it. Um, so what happened after that? Well, ultimately through history, we know as predicted again in the Bible, the Medo-Persian Empire was placed by, the, by uh, Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire, who conquered the whole known world and promptly died. And when he died in 323 BC, that started what we now know as the Hellenistic period. This is all in the intertestamental, that's kind of a Protestant rendering of that period, um, intertestamental period between the Old Testament and New. But, uh, but during that uh, time of the Hellenistic period, when, when Alexander the Great died, uh, his, his empire was split between the Seleucids uh, in the north and the Ptolemies that went south to Egypt. And under the iron fist of a horrible Seleucid king, um, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, um, we, the first iteration as predicted by Daniel of what we would call the abomination that causes desolation. So this horrible king, who is a precursor of what's to come, uh, you know, slaughtered, uh, set up a temple to Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem, slaughtered a pig's pig on the altar, forced the, the Jewish um, priest to drink pig's blood, which is clearly abominable. Now, I want to camp on this thought for a minute, okay? You go, oh, yeah, that was predicted. That's the abomination causal desolation that, that was predicted by Daniel. And, and yes, in a lot of ways, that is true. But what you need to understand as you're looking at these type of scriptures that I'm throwing out at you is prophetic scripture many, many times, and this is just one, I think, very clear example from scripture, is the now but the not yet, okay? There's a near-term sneak preview, if you want to call it that, of what's coming, and that clearly happened in Antiochus Epiphanes, but that's not the ultimate fulfillment. Don't take my word for it. Take Jesus' word for it. When he was asked in Matthew 24, so this is roughly 200 years after Antiochus Epiphanes, he was asked by his disciples uh, right before he was crucified, hey, what's going to be the sign of your coming? How are we going to know, you know it's time? And he said, well, wars, rumors, wars, uh, famine, pestilence, earth, but that's not it. That's the beginning of birth pains. Then you're going to be hated for my name's sake. You're going to be dragged into courts. The whole world's going to hate you. Um, but that's not it either. But there's when you see the abomination that causes desolation as spoken up through the prophet Daniel, don't go home, don't grab your stuff, hit the road, leave, flee to the mountains right then, because that's going to start um, this, what we're looking to. So clearly what happened two years, 200-ish years before that was not the ultimate fulfillment of the abomination that causes desolation. Christ has not returned. He said this is going to be imminent before his return. So that is still to come. Okay, so um, keep that in mind as we move forward. So that, that prompted the Maccabean Revolt. There was a brief period of time under the Hasmonean dynasty that Israel had a quasi-independence. That all ended when the Roman general Pompey showed up and uh, wrecked shop and took over Jerusalem in 63 B.C., so we all know that under the time of Christ, it was the Roman Empire that, that, that controlled that area, Pontius Pilate, guys like that, King Herod in, um, in Jerusalem. So where were the Jewish people? Physically, there was a significant remnant in the land in Israel in that first century AD. Spiritually um, and, and physically, they were scattered as well. You know, huge numbers of them scattered throughout the Middle East. Spiritually, they were dead. Okay, um, the, while no longer, this is one of the, the cool things that did come out of their time in Babylon, they were no longer tempted to keep going back to the idols. Uh, there's no evidence that, that, that Israel after that point struggled with the idolatry of the Canaanites. Um, but they had developed a works-based religion based on the separation to the law. Okay, we got the law, the law is good from God. But they put law upon law over laws with other laws, uh, you know, building this huge circle of laws around the law. Uh, and that was their religion. It was a works-based thing. It, they, they had primarily divided up into four sects of Jews. We got the Pharisees and the Sadducees that we interact with in the New Testament quite a bit. But they also had the Essenes, kind of out in the desert, from whom we get the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the, and the Zealots, which we've heard of Simon the Zealot, who was one of the, uh, the apostles there. Um, but their apostate system 
was set up to establish their own righteousness. You know, we are righteous. We follow the law. We do these things, not these other people around us. Okay, there are two religions in the world. Okay, there is do, and that's all the false religions of the world, and that's what this one is. Is do, 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 and done. Okay, that's, that's the only true religion, and that's, that's Christianity. That is the difference between Judaism and Christianity to, even today. Um, that, that, this is the paradigm that they had when Christ was on the scene. And spoiler alert, it's roughly the paradigm they still have today. Um, they knew. Now, you get into to the leaders of Israel at that time. They didn't need a savior. Okay, if you were to ask them about the Savior, they, no, we don't need a Savior. What they were looking for was a deliverer from their enemies in the negative circumstances they found themselves under the you know, iron fist of Rome or whoever it might be. That's what they were looking for. They, they were all about this line of Judah thing, but the Lamb of God, yeah, not interested in that guy, even though they knew the Scripture backwards and forwards. Okay? Um, that was then... If you were to listen to, I listen to a lot of content, and if you find me later, I can show you some of the ones I do, um, that, that are Jews today. Um, it is, it's amazing. It, it, this has been going on since Zionism, since the 1800s, and maybe even before. But, but October 7th has amped up uh, the, in the heart of the Jewish people's return to, to Israel. I listen to this podcast called Israel Cast. From all I can tell, the guy who runs it is not a Christian. His guests are anything but Christian in the most of the cases. In some ways, I can't even mention here. Um, but interesting thing, they're not religious Jews. Uh, this one guy was a Soviet Jew, um, had no, no um, you know, real ties with Israel. But through persecution, uh, the wall fell. He ended up in the adult entertainment industry. And now uh, he's, he's a leading part of that. Um, and yet... He's being drawn to Israel. Um, he got Israeli citizenship, dual as U.S. Israeli citizenship about 10 years ago. And after October 7th, he's living there and funding the IDF with the proceeds from his business. Okay? This is happening all over the world. I sat at a bar 10 years ago um, in Philly. And, and I had a 20-something-year-old Jewish girl sitting next to me as a college student there. And we got to talking. And I started pulling out Isaiah 70, 53 uh, with her. And, and, you know, there's most of these Jews, there's the, ultra, the orthodox, the ultra-orthodox, and they're, they're clearly looking for their Messiah. Hey, it, spoiler alert, too, um, watch the news in the next month or two with seven red cows or five red cows from Texas um, and how that might really shake things up um, even more. Um, so... Keep your eyes on Israel. It's the timepiece. But, um, but this girl, she didn't know any of this stuff. I got to talking to her about it from their scripture. And there's a guy eavesdropping, 57-year-old um, lawyer from Colorado. I, he was just sitting over there eating a hamburger. And he goes, I'm Jewish too, and I agree with her. I said, okay, we'll pull up a chair. So, so we sat there, the, me between the two of them, and went over this stuff. Um, so... God is working on the hearts of these people, has been down through the ages. But their paradigm as a whole is a false paradigm. Okay, um, time of Christ, Luke chapter 4. Turn there, if you will. This is the start of Jesus' public ministry. He uh, he's grown up. We know, we know the story. First years worked in his dad's carpenter shop. Went around and started doing some pretty miraculous things. Started feeding people and healing people. And hey, his name's starting to get out there. People know who he is. And, um, and this is the start of his public ministry in Luke chapter 4, verse 14 through 28. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and handed it to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. Let me pause right there. By the time Israel, the Jewish people were back in the land and this is the setting, 
Judas religion was based on the synagogue. They still had the temple, the second temple period. And, and this was, so synagogues everywhere where there were Jewish people, and they would be taught by the elders and the scribes there with the, the, you know, the political class being the Pharisees and Sadducees. So, so this is very common, you know, what I just read. He goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath, but Jesus shows up, and this is what happened. He, he started reading, and uh, this is from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? So he's saying... I am the Messiah. This is a messianic passage. You go, this is here, and it's me. And you can imagine how shocked they were. But they're like saying great things about him. Jesus said to them in response, he goes, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet none of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. So what, went, what happened, the difference between hey, this guy's great, you know, he's bringing free food and healing people and stuff, to that quick, we want to kill him and try to kill him. Because he said, you guys are sick. He goes, I can't even come to you. I'm here to free the prisoners from their sins. You're sinners. They go, we're not sinners. He goes, I had to go to these pagan countries around you and heal these guys when I last visited you. So that went over like a ton of bricks. Um, and we know what, what uh, Jesus did after that. He called his disciples, a bunch of fishermen, a bunch of nobodies, went around to, uh, to all over Israel for three years, fulfilling over 300, and that's conservative, 300 Mesiotic prophecies. Everything the Old Testament said that the Messiah would do, he did. Um, from healing the blind, from raising the dead, you name it, he did it went around, fulfilled it, and we know what happened. John uh, chapter 1 sums it all up and says, he came to his own, and his own received him not. We don't want that guy. And then they finally succeeded in killing him. Um, so, uh, at the time of Christ, now let me, let me throw a little grace here towards these people. This was a difficult thing for them to process. This was difficult even for the most ardent followers of Jesus Christ uh, to understand. So if you were to find the most ardent follower of Jesus Christ at the time, that would be John the Baptist. Jesus himself said, because of all the you know, men born of women, this guy's the top. So the very best amongst them, who was, his whole life was, was called, you know, pro prophesied by Elijah, prepare the way of the Lord, um, turn to, to Matthew chapter 11. Okay, here's, here's this, John's in jail for this whole thing, about to be beheaded, um, and he sent his disciples, this is John chapter 11, I mean Matthew chapter 11, I'm sorry, verse 1 through 6, and after Jesus had finished instructing the 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the town of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one that is to come, or should we expect someone else? He's not doing what we thought he was going to do. He's doing a lot of other stuff, but I'm a little confused here is what John is saying. And Jesus replied, he says, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is being preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. So a little bit of admonishment of John, he says, go back to scripture, John, look at what it said. When the whole world is confused, don't be confused, okay? Look at what Scripture said. Open your eyes around you and see what's happening, okay? 
Um, and of course, John did stay faithful and got his head cut off. So um, three years later, after Jesus um, you know, started his public ministry, Matthew 23, turn a few pages over to Matthew chapter 23. This is his, he find, you know, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And, and this, is, this is a moment of profound sadness for Jesus. Um, came his own, his own received him not. Um, anybody who tries to paint you a picture of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, take him to this pasture, pa passage of scripture and give him the rest of this story, okay? So this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees at the time. He goes, you snakes. You brood of vipers, how will you escape being contemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come the righteous blood uh, that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all of this will come upon this generation. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. It, picture it. He's probably in tears at this point. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the final indictment. This is the final indictment by the judge of all the universe of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. You're about to be spread amongst the nations, dead as a doornail, is what he's saying. Um, but if you read, don't skip over, the whole you will not see me again strongly implies they will see him again. Okay? Um, but not till they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So there are people who say, that, all, yeah, all, Cliff, all this stuff was done in 70 AD. Yeah, this is, okay. Clearly, a lot of this was accomplished in 70 AD. That was the next major thing for the House of Israel. Um, the Roman, three Roman legions with about a legion's worth of Arab fighters that wanted to join in the killing. Hey, we're going to kill Jews. We want to join too. And they, they joined in and, and killed lots and lots of Jews, burned the temple down, ransacked it all. Um, we know what happened. Um, but, this wasn't all accomplished in 70 AD, okay? Again, this is the now, but the not yet, okay? There's more to come. That's a sneak preview of what may be coming down the pike, but, um, but that is not the ultimate fulfillment. Christ did not return in 70 AD. We're still waiting on his return. So um, the, what happened after that? Well, uh, most, most of Israel missed it. There are a few that got it. Um, Peter said, hey, Peter, who have been saved in him? He goes, well, some say Elijah, some say a prophet. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Bingo, Peter. On that rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's where we're at today. We're in the church age. It started at Pentecost. Uh, read about it in Acts chapter 2. The, the flame, they were there together. And the rushing wind blew in. In flames of fire that separated with tongues of fire on their heads. They were able to speak in language. This is, this is a reversal of Babel. Okay? This, is, this is God bringing the good news back to the nations that are in rebellion to him, using the church, that's us, to do it. Okay? And, and don't miss the imagery here. When you see the wind, that's the blowing. That's the spirit of God moving. Okay? Uh, it's throughout scripture, multiple places. The fire, that's the presence of God. Okay, in the church, in our lives, in the Holy Spirit, in us. In the tongues, that's the good news. That's the gospel being given to the church to go spread throughout the nation. So, um, so that's, that's, that started the church age, or otherwise known as the time of the Gentiles. So where was Israel? Again, 70 AD, 73 AD. You've heard of Masada, um, of outcropping of, of Israelis in the Negev Desert on a mountaintop. Uh, a thousand of them committed suicide rather than submit to the Roman authorities in the siege of Masada. I think to this day that's where IDF Special Forces are commissioned on the top of that mountain. 132 AD, Jewish Revolt, number two. Um, Emperor Hadrian wiped him out forever and ever, amen, and uh, renamed the whole sorry place uh, Palestina. So we're not even going to call it Israel anymore. <laughs> this is just a last, you know, 
to you sorry Jews, um, you're getting what you deserve, then, um, then we're going to call this place Palestine. That's where you get the name Palestine. Okay? Um, so, for 2,000 years, the beginning uh, of the century, or 2,000 years ago, um, the Jewish people have been spread all over the world. Somehow have managed to maintain a very distinct culture, identity. Um, through that time, I've been all over the world. You can walk up and down any airport in the East Coast, especially in New York, and you will see Jews. They're very distinct in how they operate and what they look like and how they act. Um, distinct culture. Um, there's a book, I highly recommend it, called The Israel Test. Um, a lot of great stuff in that book, but one of the things that, that, that they talk about in this book is, and this is not written by an Israeli or a Jew, this is written by you know, a Christian, and that, that there is a, they are a people group distinct among the nations that is endowed with an eight brilliance per capita unlike any other people in the world. And it's, it's undeniable. Um, in, in the arts, in technology, in finance, in you name it, wherever the Jews go, they turn uh, deserts into oases. Um, that's a, literally what they did in the land of Palestine uh, that nobody wanted until they showed back up and wanted it. Um, so the, uh, read about it in the Israel test. There are people that go, you know what? They're getting what they deserve. Yeah, they are. And I deserve it too, and so do you. Every one of us deserves what has been happening to the beleaguered Jewish people around the world down through the ages. So up until recent history, they were dead as a doornail, okay? You don't get more dead in a Jewish concept than dry bones uh, who've been given the spirit of stupor, is what it said in the New Testament. Blind as a bat, dead, spread throughout the world, um, distinct, but dead, okay? Um, until May 14th, 1948, when they were no longer spread around the world. And May 15th, I think it was, they declared the state of Israel, and, uh, and things have been changing ever since. So, um, if you ever go to a big airport, you know, like, I don't even know where I'm at, I don't know what gate my gate, or how to figure this out, or you go to a big mall, and you're like, I, I know there's a store here, but I don't know where. You get the big sign, it's all kind of convoluted, but it's got the big X that says, you are here. Okay, okay now that I know where I'm at, I, I can kind of navigate these muddy waters, okay? Um, turn to Ezekiel 37. I'm going to tell you where you are. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1 through 8. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out, of, out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, the bones come together bone to bone, and I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. This is a dead corpse standing in the land. You are here. That's where we're at. Israel is back in the land. Some of these, if you're old enough in here, might have remembered the rattling of bones coming together, that sound. At least some of your parents have, for sure. Um, when they re-entered that land, God has stood them up, put sinew and muscle and flesh and bone on them. And again, they are center stage right now of world politics roiling the earth from this little bitty spit of land in Palestine. Um, and there they are, dead as a doornail. So you want to know where you're at? There you go. We're in the white spaces between verse 8 and 9. So let's pick it up there and see what's going to happen in the not-too-distant future. Then he said to me, prophesy to, this, to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say it. 
This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, not just Judah that was there in 70 AD. It's the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy to them, say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I'll bring you back into the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you'll know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done it, declares the Lord. Flip a page earlier to Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 24. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries, I will bring you back into your own land. That's where we're at. X marks the spot, like that. And then what's he gonna do after that? I will sprinkle clean water on you. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, that would be sin, and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. This is the national salvation of Israel predicted, again, 700, this, in this case, 600 years before Christ ever hit the planet uh, in the flesh. This is, you heard Lazarus come forth. This is Jacob come forth from the dead. All right, so how do we get from here, 24 March, 2024, to there? I'm glad you asked. Um, I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but there's coming between here and there uh, a horrible time that is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, it is referred to multiple places throughout the Bible. Uh, most specifically, which we're going to read here momentarily in the book of Jeremiah. Um, so turn, if you will, to Jeremiah the prophet, chapter 30. Um, it is also referenced in Daniel 12, 1. He says, it's going to be a time of distress such as has never happened before. There was a state of Israel and will never happen again. Jesus himself, don't take my word for it, said in Matthew 24, this is, this is to be a, a time of tribulation that is unequaled from the beginning of the world and will never be equaled again. That's coming on the world. This is Jeremiah chapter 30, verse one through seven. This is the word of the Lord to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Write in a book all these words I've spoken to you. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their forefathers to possess, says the Lord. These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard. Terror, not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? Now, as an editorial comment, <laughs> at any other time in history, that would have been an obvious, duh, no. Shows you how inverted we are. Anyway, back to the text. Can a man bear children? And why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor, every face turned deathly, Hail, how awful that day will be. Uh, none will be like it. It will be like a, it will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. Okay, this is not my words. This is the word, okay? Now, we don't want that to happen in, in a rational sense. We don't want Israel to come into this. Um, October 7th is like a walk in the park. Uh, the Holocaust, child's play, compared to what's coming on in the world, on the Jewish people at this time. Um, this, this is a terrible thing. It should not be our national policy to allow this to happen. But God has sovereignly said, this is going to happen. So uh, your paradigm needs to include this that is coming down the pike. Okay, Ezekiel 38. So in the same very context here, um, Gog and Magog, um, 
you know, some people think this is separated out. I do not. Um, uh, he's going to bring the nations down on the house of Israel. Um, Joel 3 says the same thing. Nations in the valley of Jehoshaphat, uh, you know, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Revelation 16, the battle of Armageddon, we, we've heard that phrase a, a bunch of times. It's all the same look at the same, it's a different look at the same thing that's going to happen when God puts a hook in the nose. Um, you know, Israel didn't want to follow, they still don't want to follow the good shepherd. He's going to bring the worthless shepherd uh, who's going to lead the world. Hey, are you watching what's going on in the world? It, can you see the buddings of anti-Semitism everywhere? Where is it, is, it, is it plausible to think that the whole world is going to unite? Go, we got to fix this Jewish problem. Hitler got it started, but we need to finish it off. Can you see that day coming? Well, this is what it says. So, um, Israel who refuse to follow the good shepherd will covenant with the worthless shepherd. Um, there's going to be a false peace. If you read in Ezekiel 38, when Battle of Gog and Magog, he comes down from the north and and attacks a place of unwalled villages living at peace. If you were to go today to Israel, you probably couldn't get there, one. Two, if you did, you think you'd find a place at peace um, with unwalled villages? No, you'd see Uzis on every corner. You'd see them armed to the teeth. You'd see the IDF on the, you know, on the northern, on every border, uh, still, still you know, operations in Gaza. That's what you would see. So that, there's something's going to give between now and then. Maybe it's the Abrahamic Accords times two. We don't know. But there's coming a false peace, probably a temple on Temple Mount there too, um, where, where this stage is going to be set for this bloodletting that is coming on the Jewish people led by the nations of the world, all of the nations of the world, and, uh, and orchestrated by God as a judgment on apostate Israel. Okay? Um, Again, just to, to give you an idea of what that might be like, uh, let's read Zechariah chapter 13, okay? Verse 7 through 14, 2. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. That already happened. And I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish. That's two-thirds of the Jews. Yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is our God. Um, so, 1,400 Jews slaughtered on October the 7th. That's 0.009% of the roughly 15 million Jews in worldwide today. If this were to happen real soon, we're talking over 9 million Jews slaughtered. 9 million um, coming on the world. Uh, and, the, and the third that remains is going to be forged in the fire of the Great Tribulation, of the time of Jacob's trouble, of the time talked about that I just read about uh, in Scripture. Um, and if you read in Daniel 12, 7, this is when, when Daniel's like, hey, when is all the stuff that I, you gave me is going to happen? He goes, don't worry about Daniel. You're going to die. You're going to rest with your, he said, but when the power of the, of the holy people is finally broken, well, there you go. This is where it's going to be broken. There's no IDF to save them. There's no Netanyahu or Benny Gantz or anybody else that's going to save them from the fire here when they are surrounded by the nations um, with their you know, in the false peace that they believed in. So, just when the remnant of Israel thinks all is lost, we're done. Israel will stand its ground against all the nations. Don't take my word for it. Turn back to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1 through 5. Okay? This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel, the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, who forms the spirit of man within him and declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the peoples, all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem on that day. And again, this is, when it says that day, this day, this is the day of the Lord. This is the second coming of Christ. Okay, On that day, 
When all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move her will injure themselves. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah, and I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. You want to see where the scales start coming off the eyes? Right there. Let me read that verse again. This is, this is the paradigm that starts to shift right here. The people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. Not because we're stronger, we're better, we got the best military, we got F-35s, we got whatever we think we want. All that stuff is gone. And the only thing they got is their Lord Almighty. This is the turning point. Verse 6 through 9. On that day, I will make the leaders of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile. In other words, they're going to burn everything around it. Um, a flaming torch among the sheaves. They will consume right and left all the surrounding peoples. But Jerusalem will remain intact. You've heard of Stonewall Jackson. This will be Stonewall Jerusalem. Nothing's moving it. Okay? The Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first so that the honor of the house of David and of Jerusalem's inhabitants may not be greater than that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest amongst them will be like David and the house of David like that, like God. Think about that. He goes, the very weakest among them in Judah, these are the hoi polloi, are going to be like King David, the greatest warrior that ever walked in, in Israel. He goes, and the leaders are going to be like God himself. This is, this is the power that he's going to infuse into them. Like the angel of the Lord going before them. On that day, I will set out to destroy the nations that attack Jerusalem. So, 10a. Um, going on from there. This is, this is, again, this has never happened. I will pour out on the house of David and its inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. This is the moment from Ezekiel 37 where the breath of life is breathed back into this people. It's breathed into Israel. Second half of verse 10. They will look on me, the one whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieves bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Have you ever been with somebody, or maybe you have been, where you've had a child die? A son, your only son that you murdered. Collectively, bitter wailing. This is horror. On that day, weeping in Jerusalem will be great. Like the weaving of Hadad, Ramon, and the plain of Megiddo, the land will mourn. Each clan, that's, that's comprehensive, each clan by itself, with their wives, by themselves, the clans of the house of David and their wives, the clans of the house of Nathan and their wives, the clan of the house of Levi and their wives, the clan of Shimei and their wives, and all the rest of the clans and their wives. On that day, this verse 13:1. on that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. There is a fountain filled with blood right there. This is the actual national salvation of Jerusalem, of Israel, um, as predicted by Paul in Romans chapter 10, I think, um, where Christ will destroy the surrounding nations, release the Jewish people, captives from worldwide. So that third that remains, they're going to be enslaved. We see this in Gaza. They're, they've been over there for hundreds of days in Gaza as slaves, right there with the IDF breathing down their neck. They're going to be Jews enslaved all over the world, physically released from captivity. They're going to be Jews that have fled to, most people think, uh, Petra in Jordan. Um, but they're going to be released. God's going to release them. And the Jews that are in Jerusalem, he's going to stand uh, immovable by the nations as he destroys the nations. So, big paradigm shift. What is coming? Turn to Isaiah 53. We will close with this. 
It actually starts this narrative in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13 through 15. To see, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Don't skip over that. High, higher, highest. That is only used in Isaiah one other time as, as he's looking and seeing God on his throne. So he's saying God himself will be raised up on a cross. This is, he goes, I am coming down to do this. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any of any man in his form marred beyond human likeness so will he sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him for what they were told they will see and what they have not heard they will understand so you take any competent christian and you read this and you go that's that could only be jesus christ everybody knows this 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 is the most comprehensive look at the life, again, I read it all, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, uh, and glorification of Christ, anywhere in Scripture, it could only be Christ. But believe it or not, the main thrust of this is not Jesus Christ, if you can believe it, because this is in the past tense. Okay, get your mind around this. This was written 700 years before Christ, but this is a time in the future. All the pronouns are plural, and all the verbs are past tense. This is the salvation prayer of Israel. When they finally get it, they're looking back. And this, this is how it starts. Picture the leaders of Israel. <laughs> they're going, as, as what just unfolded in Scripture. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? We didn't get it. It was our message, and we didn't believe it. Who believed it? It's a rhetorical question. Now, if I were there, I'd say, well, you know, um, John believed it. Um, your apostles believed it. Um, the prophets that were sent to you believed it. And uh, my Sunday school class believes it. But you guys didn't. You missed it. And he's going to give an explanation as to how, how. How could we have missed this? Okay, How could we have possibly missed our Messiah? He grew up before us like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. He was a nobody from nowhere. Can anything good come from Nazareth or Galilee? Yeah, hanging out with a bunch of fishermen, a bunch of sinners, you know, um, we, we don't want to hang on with that guy. We're looking for a guy from the royal house of David. We're looking for somebody that the world thinks highly of. He was a root out of dry ground. What do you do with that? It's a sucker branch. You cut it off, right? That's what you do with a root out of dry ground. You burn it. Um, he was despite. We didn't even want to look at him. It's like, like somebody walking down a road that's got some serious problems. You don't even want to look at him. That's, that's how we esteem them. Not. We didn't esteem them. You want to know the paradigm shift? It's right here. Surely. One word. But. He took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. Deuteronomy says, cursed is the one that hangs on a tree. That's, we thought he was cursed by God. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. There's no quibbling here. This is ownership of their sin and ownership of what they did. We, all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the vicarious substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross for all that would come, right there. He was oppressed and afflicted, and he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and like a sheep before her shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. If you were to ask the rabbis today, first of all, they'd ignore this passage at every opportunity. But if they would touch on it at all, they'd somehow allegorize that all of this is just talking about the suffering Jew down through the ages. We've been beleaguered. Yeah, they've been beleaguered. When did the Jews suffer in silence? Um, they suffered on October 7th. But if you were to take a stroll through Gaza today, 
you'd have a hard time uh, making the case that they're suffering in silence. Okay? This is not about the Jewish people. This is about their Messiah, and they missed it. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, and who could speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Joseph of Arimathea, I mean, hung between two robbers, buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a rich man's tomb. 700 years before, predicted. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And he, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Hey, dead men don't prosper and see their offspring. He's alive. He was risen. There's the resurrection. And even though the Jewish people and the Gentiles killed their Messiah, it was God who did it. This was all God's plan from the start, and the Jewish people get it. This was all God's plan to save us. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify the many. That's us. He will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him. So this is God speaking now. Okay, this is switched from the past tense. This is a future thing. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils and the strong. When God comes back, as depicted in Revelation and Isaiah 63, with his robes dipped in blood, trampling the grapes of wrath, destroying the nations that have come against Israel. He's going to take their stuff and give it back to his people. And we are going to rule and reign with Christ on earth. That's what he's talking about right here. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of Midi and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the most amazing passage of Scripture ever. It's an unplumbable depth. Please dive into it and, and try your best to, to plummet. Um, they finally get it. That is absolutely spot-on correct theology by the Jewish people in their crucible when they finally get it. Okay? Um, this is the second coming of Christ. This is when he comes. And the entire body, all the elect down through the ages, from the righteous Abraham to the present, the adulterous bride of Yahweh, the, the body of Christ, will be there together, and we will sing praises together, unified, for the first time ever, as he ushers in his kingdom in fullness. The not yet has become the now. It is fulfilled. Let's pray. Lord God, it's, it's overwhelming. Give us eyes to see in this fallen generation what you are doing around us. Let us not be paralyzed by the world's philosophies, by bad theology, by the, the things of this life. Let us with eyes wide open serve you faithfully as we look to your scripture. You said in Isaiah 52 that blessed are the feet who, who bring the good news. Let us be those feet that tell Israel your God reigns. Give us the boldness to do that, to help bring your people back to relationship with you. We are grafted in. And Lord, we look to the day, we long for the day when your body, your redeemed followers are all one moving forward into your kingdom face to face with you. Until that day, I pray that you'll find us faithful. So Lord Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come and come soon. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Let's turn our microphones on and stand as we close. <clears throat> sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed. The sin of man and wrath of God has
Good week.